All right, if you have your Bibles, you turn with me in the book of Luke chapter 22. The beloved physician, Luke chapter 22 and verse number 20. Luke chapter 22 and verse number 20. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new testament in my blood which is shed for you. Father bless this holy word now. Lord give me unction to preach it. Bless it to the hearts of the people. May they have receptive hearts. All who listen in Jesus name. Amen. You can be seated. Our Lord Jesus Christ used the term New Testament. It's translated from the Greek word diatheke. Diatheke is translated both testament and covenant. In the book of Hebrews chapter number 8, it's translated covenant. The reason it is is because it is a directly bears upon Israel. And when that covenant becomes effective with them. Testament right now is what we enjoy. The New Testament. This is why your Bible is called the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But that testament does not start in Luke. It doesn't start in Matthew. It doesn't start in Mark. It starts when he dies upon the cross. Without the death of the testator, the testament is not in force. Hebrews chapter number 9. The testament is quite a thing because it is a covenant that he's made through blood with every one of us, Jew or Gentile, makes no difference whatsoever. And so the New Testament that you hold in your hands, this book is a book of books. There's no other book on the face of this earth quite like it. We have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic Gospels. And this, of course, these are arbitrary terms that have been added to it. Nowhere in the Bible does it call itself that. But a synoptic Gospels, Matthew Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they have one view, a synopsis, one view that presents to us the life of our Lord Jesus Christ complementing each other. But the Gospel of John is altogether different. It's altogether separate. And most, a lot of scholars, put it that way today, have no idea what to do with it because it doesn't fit Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's different. Nothing in there about the kingdom of heaven. And all is a Jewishness is gone from it, essentially. And it starts in eternity and goes into eternity. So the Gospel of John is quite a thing, but it's the last Gospel written about probably 90, 95 A.D. by the Apostle John. And so when you study the chronology of the New Testament and how things are progressively revealed in the Bible, it'll help you greatly in understanding Scripture. Make sure that you don't take something that is revealed later and try to do away with it with, this, with something revealed earlier. There's no conflicts in the Bible, but God is revealing progressively the things. For example, in the book of Acts, we know that uh, Apollos was preaching knowing only the, only the baptism of John. But the Bible says he sent Priscilla and Aquila to straighten him up and say to him, now that what you're saying is not necessarily wrong, but there's more to it now. And that's exactly what happened. So they preached Christ to him. So this is, a, this is one of the ways to understand the scripture. But we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you look at them, you'll see that Matthew corresponds with what we call the cherubim. A cherubim is an angelic creature. A cherubim has the face of a man, the face of an ox, the face of a lion and the face of an eagle. And when you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see that Matthew definitely matches the face of a lion because it's about a king. You look at Mark, it matches the face of an ox for it's the gospel of the, of the servant. Then you look at, Ju at the, the gospel of Luke, you, it certainly would ma uh, match the face of a man. And then you look at the gospel of John and it soars above, folks, and here we have the eagle. Only two of them have a genealogy, and that's Matthew and that is Luke. The genealogy of Luke is the genealogy of a man. The, and when we read about Adam, Adam is called the son of God. Think about that for a moment. Had to be because God was his father. God made him and created him from the dust of the ground. But the gospel of Matthew has a genealogy that says the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and the son of Abraham, the son of David. So it's a genealogy of a king. But there's five cherubim. And now watch, stay with me. There's five cherubim and not four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John matched four cherubim, but there's one missing. We read about him in the book of Ezekiel chapter number 38, and he's called the anointed cherub that covereth. This anointed cherub that covereth is different from, from, uh, from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. And so what happens to him while he shows up? If you look at Luke chapter number 4 and verse number 5, here is that fifth cherub. It says in, Matthew, in Luke chapter number 4 and verse number 5, 
And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. This had to be a miraculous thing. There is no question in my mind that has been delivered into the hands of Satan enormous power and ability. And there's not a word in the Bible that says that's been taken from him. Now, he was defeated in a spiritual sense. The Lord Jesus ripped him of his power in a sense at the cross. But as far as his, uh, his wealth and his ability to tempt and guide kings and raise up kings and guide kingdoms, he still has that power. And so this fifth cherub is an entity to be dealt with. It's a power to be considered. He must be respected. And we certainly, if you've ever had a bout with the devil, you'll respect him. If he's ever worked you over, you'll respect him. Because make no mistake about it, you're dealing with one that is higher than an angel. But when we read about a man, an ox, and, a, and, and an eagle, and a lion, and the face of these cherubim. Now this is something I just want to give you to think about and take it home and think about it this afternoon. These are creatures that were made in the book of Genesis. When he made the lion, the ox, the man, and, and, and so forth. But you see, my friend, these cherubim were made before men were made. These are cherubim. They date back into the ancient past, how far we do not know. So they bore the faces of creatures that did not exist at the time that they were made. And it gives you the foreknowledge of God and says that he can see the end in the beginning. And the reason I'm giving that to you, I want to make you think. I want you to think about who we're dealing with in here today. The Lord God Almighty never reacts to anything. He does not react. He acts. The Lord God Almighty is never surprised by any move that anything ever makes or anything that ever happens. He that sitteth in the heavens is in absolute and complete control of all the things that are happening on this earth. He took control of my life in 1973 when he saved me and he's still in control of it this morning. Amen. And the same with you. He's in control of your life. Of him, through him, to him, and by him are all things. He is above all things. So this fifth cherub, this fifth cherub is an entity that has to be dealt with. He has his own commandments. We read where God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments. It's called the Decalogue. And when he came down, he gave these into the people. But Satan has his commandments too. The Apostle John lists them for us in 1 John. He says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the commandments of the God of this world. And the God of this world loves to be worshipped. Oh, how he desires to be worshipped. Worship is quite a thing, as a matter of fact. We've met together here at Temple Baptist Church this morning to worship God. Worshiping God is a good thing. Did you know that angels can worship God? Did you know that cherubim and seraphim can worship God? Men worship God. All the creatures in creation can worship God. That is a great thing to be able to do that. Angelic beings, for example, in Isaiah chapter number six, the seraphim cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This has to do with his sovereignty, with who he is. He will not be moved. He will not be questioned. He will not be brought before men. He is God. When he says something, it's going to happen exactly the way he says it. At his birth, the Bible says that the angels of the Lord said, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number one, let all the angels of God worship him. Worship who? Worship this little baby that is born in Bethlehem of Judea. Now, my dear friend, whether the angel understood the incarnation, whether they understood that that little baby was God Almighty himself manifest in flesh, I'm not sure I understand all that they might have understood, but they accepted the fact and they worshipped this child or they refused to worship this child. This is why it says in 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse 12, unto whom it was revealed. That not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you. By them that have preached the gospel unto you. With the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Which things the angels desire to look into. So we do not look to angels for the source of truth and revelation. Where do we look? We look to the Bible. We look to the word of God. And we look for the power of the Holy Spirit of God to make it known to us. That's important. In the tabernacle, they stood over the mercy seat and they worshiped because they understood that it was there that God's presence abode in such a way that if the 
high priest walked in there on the seventh day, the tenth day of the month, and in some sense violated the holiness of God standing before that mercy seat, he could have dropped dead right there in his tracks. Think about coming before God in fear of your life. Not certain if you'll ever walk back out of that curtain again or not. Think about the fact that uh, Nadab and Abihu, the two sons of Aaron, the high priest offered strange fire to the Lord. And the Bible said when that happened, the fire of God came out and consumed them right on the spot. Imagine how that would affect your approach to the Almighty. They even said, can anybody approach this Almighty God? And yet the Bible says we have a new and living way that we can come into the very place that Aaron stood with no fear whatsoever of being smitten dead in our tracks. That we have the flesh of Christ that has opened up a way to the presence of God. And my dear friend, that is ours to partake of day in and day out. And so the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, why don't we do it? Why don't we come before that living one? Then the Bible says here that Satan desired worship in the wilderness. He desired worship from the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that Satan put test after test on Christ. One thing probably to really determine who he was. Who am I dealing with here? What is this man? Is this God? God manifest in flesh. But whatever it is, I want to give you these three things to think about and then I'll move on. They worship angel, cherubim, seraphim, and all the rest of them because of holiness, because of beauty, and because of power. Worship, these things command worship. Some of you are in here today and you go to churches where you worship because you've been stirred by the music. You worship because you've been stirred by the lights. You worship because you've been stirred by the singing. You worship because something outside has stimulated something inside and you take part in a worship service. I don't say necessarily that all of that is bad, but I say that there's something higher than that. I say there's something greater than that. You see, men can worship. Men can worship the woman with her hair, the glory of the woman. She washed his feet in their tears, washed, wiped his feet with her hair in her tears, washed his feet. She was worshiping God. When Mary came to that tomb on that Easter Sunday morning, she came and glorified God because of the one who had saved her and cast seven devils out of her. Then the, the returning prodigal, quite a thing. Do you remember him? He came back and the father ran to meet him. And when the father ran to meet him, it fell upon his neck. He showed him his love and he showed him how that he'd been looking for him, waiting for him. He loved him. And the prodigal rejoiced and shouted and praised, his, praised God. There was great worship there that day. But did you hear what the elder brother said? The elder brother said, what meaneth all of this noise? What is this that's going on? You know why he said that? Because he didn't have the ear of worship. He didn't really understand what worship was about. You see, my dear friend, worship is not a man-made thing. Worship arises from inside the soul. Worship comes from someone who knows God, who's been saved by the grace of God, whose sins have been forgiven, who've been set free. Worship comes from somebody who knows what it is, as this sister just told us. She came from a low place. Well, that's where he found me too. He found me in a low place. He saved me. He washed me by his precious blood. My, my dear friends, when the Lord God found me, he found me in the lowest of the low, in the ditch, in the pit. And he saved me and washed my sins away. I have every reason to worship him and I do worship him. I have great worship of God in the mornings. When there's no one around, I look at the heavens and I sit out there in peace with God and I worship his holy name. I have some of the best worship services I've ever been in, sitting there by myself. And if you know what I'm talking about this morning, you'll understand that if you've been saved, if you've been raised, if you've been called by the grace of God, my friend, you'll know worship because it'll come from deep down inside your soul. And worship is a wonderful thing. It's a blessed thing. It's one of those things that is a blessing to those who know him and love him. But you see, my friend, think about this for a moment. When the angel worships God, he worships God because of holiness, because of beauty, because of power, because of all of these things. But when I worship God, I worship God because of holiness. I worship him because of beauty. I worship him because of power. But I also worship him because I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. I've been washed in the blood. You see, friend, I have something the angels do not have. They've never experienced what I'm talking about because, my friend, there has been no blood applied to them. 
My friend, there has been nothing applied to them where they can say that they have a redeemer. I know of no angel from the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Not one single time that says an angel has been redeemed. But I have. I've been bought back. I've been, amen. I've been saved by the grace of God. And this is redemption. And redemption means that I worship the Lord. And that makes me, my friend, different from the angels. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 4, and they worship the dragon. Look carefully. He wanted worship and now he finally gets it. And they worship the dragon which gave power to the beast. And they worship the beast saying who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? He wants worship and he's getting it. He's going to get it. The world is prepared to worship him. You see we live in a country and we live in a nation and we live in a world that calls evil good and good evil. They call up, down, and down, up. They call black, white, and white, black. They call evil, good, and good, evil. In other words, everything is turned on its head. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed how that they are redirecting your thinking? Have you noticed how that all of the old things have been completely turned upside down? Well, the reason for that is because they're preparing the world to worship Satan. Now, they already worship the God of this world the way they live. But what I'm talking about is when he steps on the stage of time, when he steps before people, when they see him as he really is, they're going to worship him. Haven't you seen these, this statue of this, of, this, of, this, of this godless, wicked, vile creature with children standing before it and looking up at this thing? They're preparing a whole generation to worship the devil. They're making Satan, making him good. Well, this is what he wants. This is where we are. And so what do we need to do in the church? What's important about us when we come together in the house of God? When we sing good songs, hallelujah to God for what we've been singing, amen. I love the music. We come in here and we pray. That's a good thing, I love the praying. We come in here and we preach, that's good. We come in here and we have fellowship with the Lord, that's good. We come in here and we hung we're hungry and we say, Lord, come and meet with us. We want you in this place, that's good. We welcome God, amen. If he shows up, listen, if it's God or me, if it, he shows up, everything's okay. If I show up without the Lord, we, need, we got a problem. We need the Lord more than we need me. <laughs> we need him and we absolutely must have him. And so how many of you invite him? Do we welcome him? Do we want him to come into the meeting of this church? So I want you to notice something about this. This is what I prepare all of this for. They worship the dragon. How do you know who you're worshiping today? We are here, and I'll tell you right now, this church is preaching the truth. The point is to get God's word out, the truth of who Christ is. That's the foundation of it. The truth of what the blood of Christ does when you come to the Lord, it washes your sins away. The truth of what it takes to be saved, you put your trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. That's how you're born again. You're not born again by good works or holding on or whatever. And so we present this to you. We preach these things to you here in this congregation. So how do we know who we're worshiping when we begin to worship? I'll think about that. Are we worshiping Christ or are we worshiping a false Christ? There are churches in this country that want to make you feel good about yourself. And when you go into that church, it's all about you. It's all about you. That's what's important about this message. It's about you. Now, my dear friend, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. God has laid upon me a burden. And that burden is that any way I can, when I get on my face and pray, for God to open the Bible and show me in every page of this book, our Lord Jesus Christ. Search the scriptures, he said, for in them you think ye have eternal life. This is the book about the Lord Jesus Christ. If I cannot find Christ throughout this Bible, then I'm blind, dear friend. He is all through this book. And it is my responsibility as a pastor to preach Christ to you. The apostle said to the church at Corinth, I would know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified, our Lord Jesus Christ. So listen, we were made with a higher responsibility and a higher ability to rise to a higher level than even an angel. Right now, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that angels are greater in power and might. They have greater bodies, they have more power, they have more might, but they do not have what you have as a child of God. And what is that? 
the very image of God himself. Listen to this. In 1 Corinthians 15, 49, the Bible said, But as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, But we all, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We've been gifted, now listen carefully, because this is important. We've been gifted with two very important things that angels do not have. Love and prayer. Amen. Think about it. Love and prayer. Prayer is far more than simply talking to God. How do you know? Satan talked to God. In the book of Job, read it. He spoke directly to him. And the Lord God conversed with Satan in Job chapter number one. So you mean, preacher, that prayer is more than just talking? Talking is probably the least part of the very essence of prayer. It's far more important. When you read Romans chapter number eight carefully, prayer is a spiritual thing that unlocks the soul in the presence of God. A communication with God takes place that can only be described as unutterable. No words can describe the level of communion in prayer, a level higher than your own understanding. That's what real prayer is about that's recorded for us in Romans chapter number eight. This is why Satan fights your prayer. He wants you to be bored with prayer. He wants to divert your prayer. He wants to run uh, scurrilous things through your mind, meaningless junk, get your mind all tied up with a bunch of stuff. He wants to destroy your prayer life. Your prayer life is your, is your lifeline to heaven. Your prayer life is the lifeline to the very heart and soul of Almighty God. You can touch a part of God that an angel cannot touch. You have a capacity inside you that an angel does not have. And number one, Look in that Bible, search it from Genesis to Revelation, and you'll not find one time in the whole Bible that it ever says an angel prays. Does that make you think? Think about that. Say, I've never heard that before, preacher. <laughs> Run it down. Check it out. God has given us a privilege that spiritual beings don't have. You see, it's not so much that the angel does not want to pray. It necessarily doesn't have the capacity to pray. You see, my dear friend, your dog probably in its own sense loves you. It's obedient to you. It's, you, it, you you're its master. But your dog only has a capacity for so much. And you know that. You make a difference how many dogs you've had. A dog's still a dog. My friend, you are light years infinitely and eminently above a dog. You live in a generation that calls you an animal. They put a dog on television and they put people kissing a dog. Now, I don't know how you feel about that and I'm not going to get into all the details of it. But if, uh, if you knew anything about a dog, you'd understand that we've got an issue going on. Do a little research into it. Do a little checking into it. There are people on television or on YouTube whose hands and arms are gone. They've lost the limbs of their body. And how did it happen? What caused it to happen? Kissing their dogs. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Kissing their dogs. You boys, save your kissing for the girls. And girls save you kissing for the boys and boys don't save you kissing for the boys and girls don't save you kissing for the girls. Amen. Boys kiss girls, Amen. girls kiss boys. Amen. How many, how many, how many got, you don't have a problem with that? Good. I'm in the right crowd. <laughs> Thank God. No, no. But a dog is a dog. Give me a good friend. Sure, dogs do a lot of things and all this and that. I'm not against dogs. But what I'm trying to tell you this morning is hey, you're not an angel. You are a man, mankind, man and woman, made in the image of God. You have the capacity to reach in to the heart of God in such a way that an, even an angel cannot do. 
You have access to the Lord in such a way. Why? Because you have a capacity for it. That's why. When he said he made you in his image, it means that there's more about you, my dear friend, than we'll ever know in this life until we come to that world. When that image begins to really unfold for us, we look in a faith, the Bible teaches us that we're looking into a glass now, but the time will come when we'll see far more than we see right now. So you are being robbed. You're being robbed of your essence. You're being robbed of what makes everything important about who you are. If you're not praying, are you praying? Start praying. Start, start talking to God again. Get down on your knees and talk to the Lord. If it's just a little bit today and a little bit tomorrow, talk to him and he'll talk back to you. That's what you're missing. You can't live right. You can't keep commandments. You can't read your Bible. No, reading Bible's fine, but you cannot replace prayer. There's nothing, nothing, nothing that you can do in your life that will replace prayer. Here's the second thing, and this is so important, and that is love, love. Now, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about this, this, uh, this, this meaningless junk today that they call love. I'm talking about love. I'm talking about real love. I'm talking about the kind of love that you begin to trust and depend upon. I'm talking about the kind of love that looks at you and you know he's looking into your heart and he's looking into your soul. He reads you better than you can read yourself. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows more about you than ever, you'd ever know about yourself. And yet in spite of all of that, you know he hadn't forsaken you. You know he won't lead you, leave you. And you know he loves you. And you know why? Because he gave you a capacity to love. There's not a word in the Bible. Now, here we go again. There's not one word in that Bible that says an angel loves God. Not that they wouldn't want to. I don't doubt for a moment that angels would want to love God. But the truth, the truth is they have no capacity for it. That's not what they're made for. The Bible said angels are ministering spirits to minister the heirs of righteousness. That's who we are. They minister to us. You remember when the Lord Jesus was in the garden? You remember when his, his sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood? Well, what did the Bible say happened? The angels of the Lord came and they ministered to him. They ministered God's word to him. They did what they're supposed to do. They're ministers. They can now transform themselves and they can come as a man. They can appear as a man, but they're still not men. We're not, they're not a man. An angel is a created being. It's a spirit being that is a minister to serve Almighty God. Now listen to what it says over here in 1 John 4, 9. We love him because he first loved us. We can detect it. We can sense it. We know it. And we're made for it. We are judged with a different standard than angels. We are judged with a higher standard than angels. You're more complex than an angel. There's far more to you than to an angel. Now, three things I want you to think about here this morning. I want you to think about these. I want you to think about the mind of God, the heart of God, and the essence of God. I'm not talking to angels. I'm talking to men and women created in the image of God. I'm talking to someone that has the capacity to take hold of what I'm telling you now. You have the capacity to take it deep down inside your soul and your spirit and your essence and your being and make decisions based upon the gifts that you've been given as a human being. This is why you are accountable for the light that you receive and the light you reject. You are accountable for the desire whether you want light or you don't want light. You are accountable unto Almighty God in a sense that nothing else is because you have the capacity for it. You can't hide behind people. That's you know, not going to work because there's more to you than that. You've been made in the image of God. I want you to think about this now. Number one, the mind of God. The mind of God. The mind of God. The heart of God. And the essence of God. You'll see the mind of God in this. John 17, 24. Father, I will also whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. The, what does that mean? That means that he loved him as the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the offering for our sin, the one who took away the sin of the world before Adam ever sinned. Now let your mind go into that. 
1 Peter 1, 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Foreordained before the foundation. Revelation 13, 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. What does that mean? That means foreknowledge. That's the mind of God. When you look around you, you say to yourself, what a mess. What a horrible thing. The killing, look at all the killing right now in the Holy Land. They're taking little babies and putting them in ovens. A living baby put it in an oven and cook it to death. That's depravity. That's depravity. But think of it. Revelation 13. Slain from the foundation of the world. Does that do anything in your mind for the mind of God? Does that make you think? And then the heart of God. I'm going to give you one verse. John 19, 17. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. That word means skull, Latin Calvaria, skull. Bearing his cross. Does that touch your heart? Does that touch your heart? You can preach that to your dog all day long and your dog will just sit there and look up at you. Why? It has no capacity to receive it. Are you following? Love your dog, dog loves you, fine. But your dog does not have the capacity to respond you do. You do. And now it has been laid before you. Now it goes into that spirit and that soul. It goes deep into who you are and what makes you who you are. Think of him carrying his cross. His cross. I could not carry his cross. I could never carry his cross. No one else could carry his cross. He carried his cross. And he carried it to Golgotha. And he was nailed to it. And there he suffered horrible agony. And there for six hours he hung, he bled, and then finally he died. And think about the fact that before man was ever made, God had settled that he was the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. Think about that. Think about that. Does that move you? Does that stir you? And then finally, the essence of God. The mind of God the heart of God, and the essence of God. Say, what is the essence of God? Here's a little bit to help us to get started in the right track. God's a spirit. He's a spirit. We don't know the essence of a spirit. I've told you a thousand times. But the reason I keep telling you is because this helps you understand everything else. We don't know, but we do know this. Matthew chapter 11, verse 26. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. This is God reaching out from his essence and his Son becoming one of us. He became a man so that he could take us back into that essence, into that presence of Almighty God in a way that we could never do ourselves. Matthew chapter five, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Clean, pure, in a spiritual sense, from the pollution and guilt of sin. One day, when he has perfected the spirit, here's what he says in Hebrews 12. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now let's put the third part together. First John 3, beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, this is who we see, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You are a tripart being, body, soul, and spirit. And when God is finished with you, the body, soul, and spirit will all be perfected. 
and be able to come into the very presence of God himself. I like to think of it like this. Here's a huge multitude. You're in heaven. And all the angels are spread out before him. And they're bowing down and their heads are down. And they're worshiping God. Rightfully so. He is worthy of our worship. All creation worshiping God. But those of you who have been born of the Spirit of God bears the very image of God can lift up your head from all that vast number and look him in the face and look at him and love him and return to him what he has given to you. If you don't get this part of my message, you've missed everything that's important this morning. What is that? That you love him. That you really love him. Do you love him? Have you ever known enough about him? Have you ever experienced enough about him? Is there enough in your soul this morning that really causes you to love him? That you are motivated because you love the Lord God. Is he worthy of love? Does he deserve love? Of course he does. But do you have the capacity today to love him? Are you full of yourself? Most people are full of themselves. They're full of themselves. There's nothing left to love God. And I'm not talking about some cheap, superficial, artificial garbage. I'm talking about real love that will motivate and change your life and make you love him, serve him, live for him, and everything will be about him to love him. Have you reached that place? You know what gets me through from day to day, from week to week? It's my Lord. I strengthen myself. I encourage myself in the Lord. We encourage each other. We support each other. That's a good thing. But I'll tell you something else that wells up inside my soul, folks. I love him. I love him. I love the Lord God Almighty. I love his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I love him with all of my heart and all of my soul. There's none greater than to love him. And there is strength in that that you'll not get anywhere else. Do you love him? Do you really? The Bible says in the book of the Song of Solomon, love is strong as death. Love is a strong thing. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you, Lord, use what I preached this morning. Somehow or another, make it real to the hearts of the people. I got, I got up and gave the words, but Lord, the Holy Spirit has to take what I've said. He has to write it inside us. He has to make it real to us. He has to make it have meaning to us. And I pray for that. I pray for that. I pray, Father, move in our soul and our spirit. I pray this will help somebody. What's the point? If it doesn't, I want it to help somebody. Search your heart. Do you love the Lord God? Because you have the capacity to. Do you love him? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up this morning.